It's gonna be a trashy show. Today we are plagued by visions of the most unpalatable and noxious kind. Viscera, fluids, and bodily secretions abound, an assault on every sense. The stench of burnt hair and congealed blood, the texture of guts and open wounds, the taste of things that should never touch a human tongue. Today's visions are not for the faint of heart, so please grab a barf bag before you proceed. Welcome to another installment of Plagued by Visions, where we explore literature that would make you go, well, that wasn't very nice. I am your host, Juan, and I'm so happy you finally get to see what the rest of my room looks like. You know, it's very homey, it's very cozy, just how I like it. Please make yourself at home, but don't touch my garbage. It's mine. Anyway, today we are going to explore somewhat familiar territory that is nonetheless completely different. So it is no secret that the most popular series on this channel is my disturbing book series in which we explore the most disquieting, shocking, visceral literature ever printed. Titles that rattle you, make you uneasy and anxious and completely shake the foundation of your reality. You know, the good stuff. I have always appreciated the extremely positive reception that those videos have gotten and of course as I've stated before that series is far from over. But today I wanted to address a topic that arose in my mind after reading a couple of comments that you all left in those videos. Of course I appreciate all the support and engagement and every single book recommendation of the disturbing kind is highly valued around here but I keep sensing that there is a sort of disconnect, at least in my mind and in my opinions, as to what the word disturbing means. Essentially, every once in a while I'll get comments like, you forgot this one book, it's so disturbing because it almost made me throw up. You forgot this other book, it made me so nauseous, it made my stomach turn and I had to sprint to the toilet. You forgot this other book, it was so unbelievably graphic, there were buckets of shit and blood thrown about every which way. You forgot this one book, it is the most disgusting book I have ever read, etc, etc. I believe that I must address my own definition of what disturbing is and why I have resisted including titles of extreme fiction or splatterpunk or the scatological misadventures that you all keep clamoring for me to include in my disturbing book series. Now when I think disturbing fiction and this you will see reflected in the various personal recommendations I've included in those videos, my mind does not immediately go to blood, guts, and poop. To me, disturbing fiction tends to refer to a mode of storytelling with much more insidious psychic attacks. To me, a book can be disturbing without containing a single drop of blood or piss. Uh, disturbing fiction can work in extremely subtle and unexpected ways, wrestling with questions about the human condition, about our embodiment, about our social and personal relations, and things can become twisted, deeply upsetting, and unbearable without needing to resort to shock or gore. Now, of course, graphic violence and toilet talk can most certainly be extremely disturbing and upsetting to some, but for me, perhaps after just years and years of being exposed to the goriest horror films, to writing ranging from the transgressive fiction of Ballard and Selby Jr. to the personal love letters of James Joyce, really violence and scatological illusions don't disturb me that much at all. When I look for disturbing books, I look for those inventive and unsettling thrills that are bound to devastate me and even threaten my stability in ways that I do not think possible. And so I've looked beyond the usual go-to genres of horror and splatterpunk to satiate this need. However, that doesn't mean that your boy doesn't like to get down and dirty from time to time. I mean, obviously. Disgust, grotesquerie, shock value are still highly, highly welcomed on this channel. If it's grime and muck you want, you shall receive it, my friends. Therefore, to please all of my gore hounds, all my lovers of filth, 
Today we're going to talk about 10 of the most disgusting, dirty, revolting, and fetid titles that I have ever read for your own viewing displeasure. And yet you'll see that I still chose to get a little bit inventive with some of my picks. I mean, I could have easily just filled up this list with 10 titles of extreme fiction and granted, yes, don't worry, there's gonna be some of that. And yet you will find that some of these picks of disgusting literature are here for reasons that you may not see coming. After all, nausea and unsavoriness come in all shapes and sizes. The word disgust, yes, generally refers to those scenes of stink and rot that make you gag, but it can also refer to a deeper sense of revulsion, a disapproval of something so immoral and vile that it can't be handled, and we're certainly going to keep that other definition in mind as well. So without further ado, sit tight, pinch your noses, tighten your stomachs, and get a hold of your gag reflex because we're about to dumpster dive into the dirtiest, most repellent corners that literature has to offer. Now first off, before we get into the actual list, I want to name drop a couple of titles in a list of dishonorable mentions. I have three such mentions uh, that I want to get out of the way. Two of them are here because uh, the entirety of the work is not altogether disgusting per se, and yet there are glimpses and sequences contained in them that I simply cannot leave out of a list of this kind. The third dishonorable mention is a book I have already covered in a previous list, and yet it would fit this list as much as it fits the previous one, and so I still feel compelled to mention it here. My first dishonorable mention is Naked Lunch by William S. Burroughs, first published in 1959. Naked Lunch is often relegated to the status of a classic, often the subject of academic discussions and taught at multiple college courses. This drug-laden, disjointed trip into the underbelly of 1950s America is at times humorous, at times aggressive and unhinged, but overall I would say it's more of a curious and genuinely thought-provoking cultural artifact rather than just outright shock and puke-inducing tactics. However, yes, there's some of that in here. In particular, uh, Burroughs decided to dedicate copious passages tripping through sweaty orgies, various excretions, and there's even bloody decapitations of adults and children alike throughout its pages. While definitely not a work of transgressive fiction of the kind that we're used to, Naked Lunch must be included in this countdown since I see so many of its stylistic and thematic choices as extremely influential to the later writings of authors who forge transgressive fiction as a genre looking to push the boundaries of taste, conformity, and censorship. I see a lot of that literary history starting here. Up next, my second dishonorable mention goes to Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, first published in 1973. Now, the vast majority of this gargantuan and near unreadable tome is much more concerned with exploring idiosyncratic conspiracy theories regarding the trajectory of war missiles and whether or not they center around the movements of some random soldier who is unassuming as well as just not that interesting. As well, there are various faces and personalities in here, some real, some ambiguous, some definitely fake, that make up the cacophony and monstrosity of World War II as covered in this book. But among the various colorful characters that make up the almost impenetrable wall of text that I hold here in my hands, there is a standout from the days in which I was reading this and a particular scene that just hasn't left my mind since reading this almost six years ago. It involves a soldier who has a liking towards hiring sex workers and having them uh, relieve themselves on him. Not number one, number two, and not just on him, like in him. I don't want to be uh, much more explicit than that, but having read that, it still haunts me and it stands out in my memory as one of the few instances in my life in which a book actually managed to make me nauseous. The level of detail and meticulous descriptions allotted to that scene are something only someone like Pynchon could manage. Pynchon is not someone who focuses on writing for shock or gross out, but 
I shudder to think of the possibilities if he ever decided to write an entire work in that style. Needless to say, I'd probably feel compelled to read it. And lastly, in our dishonorable mentions, as I said before, is a book that I already covered in a previous video, and yet this list would have probably been a lot more suitable for a work like it. It is Cows by Matthew Stokey, first published in 1998. I talked about this book in the first video I ever made back in July of 2020 and mentioned it as a title that disturbed me because of its graphic depictions of, uh, well, everything. Violence, murder, bestiality, excrement, just all of it thrown into a blender then thrown at a wall. If you want to hear my further thoughts on this novel, you can go ahead and check out that video. But yes, I found the pros in here, albeit disgusting, actually much more frightful and disturbing because of the humanity displayed in its characters and there's even moments that could be construed as uh, touching? in some way. So I do see its title of disturbing book here on this channel just as fitting but there's plenty, plenty in here that is just downright disgusting. Essentially this list cannot go by without me reminding you that cows exist and always to read at your own risk. All right now that we've got those out of the way let's go ahead and get into my top 10 most disgusting books list. As always this list is not in order of ascending disgusting levels or anything like that. We're simply going alphabetically by author's last name. So let's go ahead and see what we can dig out of here. All right let's dig in. Hmm. Oh is that the book? Oh nope too soft. Too gooey. Hmm. Oh, ah, here it is. Uh, we have Frisk by Dennis Cooper, first published in 1991. Now, Dennis Cooper is an author we've mentioned previously on this channel. I reviewed his novel The Sluts in a previous video and that book impacted me so much that I just had to go ahead and jump into whatever else he had written. I decided to explore his George Miles Cycle series, a pentalogy of short novels centering around themes of sexual obsession, the conflation of love and violence, and mostly the various means of depravity haunting Mr. Cooper's brain. Needless to say, I got as far as this, the second installment, before I had to take pause and just really think about like my life choices. In Frisk, Cooper explores a hopefully fictionalized account of his experiences with various lovers and his fixation with pornography, sex, and an endless quest for love that is never quite fulfilled. And I believe that's the level of disgust that Cooper is able to explore best. There's a gut-wrenching sensibility to everything he writes, a, a feeling that we are slowly falling out of reality, just straying away from sanity and humanity, plunging into the most derelict corners of filth, crime, sexuality, and chaos as the action in this short but powerful book takes us and refuses to let go. It is definitely best described as a disgusting book, for even though there's plenty in here to unsettle and disturb at another level, overall my experience reading this was largely one of just feeling dirty, like I needed to set this book on fire and have a five hour shower. The book does read a lot like an homage to like the French decadent movement of the 19th century, that symbol ridden fixation with disenchantment and self-destruction, uh, very much mirroring other authors we've covered in this channel before such as Rimbaud and Wiesmans. But as much as it is decadent, it is equal times grimy, bottom of the barrel, VHS, porno extreme. There's constant descriptions of depraved sex acts that are founded in reality, and yet Cooper is so interested in exploring that liminal space between reality and fiction and blurring the two that some moments simply elevate to utter absurdity. The unimaginable sex acts here described, including genital dismemberments and drug-fueled snuff films and a pornographic scene involving dynamite and assholes being blown into pieces, are not for the faint of heart. Definitely a weird yet vibrant book and Cooper's writing always leaves one with a pungent aftertaste, an empty stomach and a feeling that you've just stumbled upon something that you really shouldn't be reading no matter how old you are. 
it, it is really akin to that experience now that I think about it. it. It is the literary form of dirty magazines hidden away under your parents' bed, of the adult section at a video store, that feeling of inappropriateness incarnate. Cooper writes with admittedly admirable ferocity, and yet from reading his work, I felt an emptiness, an undeniable vacuous sense that we are reading depraved fantasies that even he, I suspect, found too unwieldy and gross to bottle inside, and thus these books were born. Fascinating stuff, but I warn you, be ready to feel absolutely repulsed as the pages drum up to their momentous climax. <laughs> All right, let's see what else we got inside this bad boy. Huh, that's weird. I don't remember throwing away chicken pot pie. Oh, <laughs> that's not chicken pot pie. Ah, here we go. Come on, baby. Ah, here it is. Our second book, A Feast of Snakes by Harry Cruz, first published in 1976. Let me tell you, if we want to talk about grit, if we want to talk about uncompromising prose and explore depravity, desolation, blood, sweat, and tears, and that feeling that you just rolled all over a pile of manure, we have to talk about Mr. Cruz. Well into the first decade of his writing career, Cruz initially wrote books that certainly still reflect his taste for vices and degeneracy, yet his earlier efforts still contain a relative tameness, really holding back just to reach a semblance of something like properness or literariness. Here, however, Cruz decided to just let go and instead embrace a style of writing that was true to his own voice and his own unique life experiences which revealed so much more grittiness, monstrosity, violence, and weirdness than anyone could have previously imagined and forever cemented Cruz as a staple name in the transgressive and savage world of the southern gothic. A Feast of Snakes takes us through the fictional town of Mystic, Georgia, where a yearly festival named the Rattlesnake Roundup is held, in which the locals just release a bunch of snakes into the wild, and then they go out and shoot them to death, because apparently that's what people do for fun in the South. Our main character here is Joe Lawn, a high school football star has-been, who now mostly occupies himself with drinking beer and shooting things much like everyone else in this town. Except that this particular rattlesnake roundup, things are about to go especially awry as Joe Lon is confronted not just with an unforeseen lack of law enforcement at the festival, but conflicting feelings of disappointment and rage re-emerging upon the reappearance of his high school sweetheart. Cruz writes in a ravaging style that pulls no punches, does not tread cautiously around debauchery, but rather dives nose first into it. Here we go into a world full of violence, rape, and castration. More so than this explicit violence, however, that, you know, definitely lends to the disgustingness found throughout, Cruz has a preternatural ability to unsettle a reader through descriptions. The way every single bit of the scenery in Mystic Georgia is presented conjures up an unshakable unease. Characters just feel untrustworthy, they feel dirty, depraved, and the violence, oh the violence is unlike anything I've ever read. It's in your face, it's a blinding sort of day glow, a quintessence of gunpowder and reptile guts, accompanied by a main character slowly slipping into insanity, where the orgy of violence of the rattlesnake roundup, which already started as crazed, escalates into a full-blown apocalypse in a way only Cruz could have envisioned. Cruz is always a delight to read if you're a fan of transgressive fiction, and his handling of difficult and downright existential questions is not done with detached academic intrigue or delicate morose ponderings. No, no, no. Cruz was a man of the gun, and a man who believed in nothing except man's ability to harm and self-destruct, and with that, here he's brought a tale so cruel and vile that it is bound to make you empty your gut before it gets pummeled. This book provokes a human disgust so severe that it must simply be included in a list of its kind. Trust me, it will stick to your brain the way grime sticks under your fingernails. <coughs> Alright, now if I recall correctly, there's another book in here somewhere, but looks like I'm gonna have to really dig into this one. Oh, oh man, this one's really stuck in there. Yep, 
It's all the way at the bottom. Oh, I'm going to have to put my back into it. Oh, oh my God. Oh. You don't want to see what's in here. Oh, oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. Ah, here it is. Oh, no wonder it was stuck. It's the 120 Days of Sodom by the Marquis de Sade. A particularly sticky read. I mean, really, the countdown could just end here, couldn't it? Once we bring this sucker out, it's game over. But no, honey, we're just getting started. Now, the backstory of this book and its author are just as twisted and repulsive as the book itself. So why don't we just go ahead and touch into that a little bit? So the Marquis de Sade is perhaps the most infamous figure representative of the Libertines, a loose category referring to those of de Sade's era who freely partook in hedonism and sexual freedom, often, as in the case of de Sade, to an extreme degree. De Sade himself was a despicable man, a man who enjoyed uh, fly-infested orgies and had more than questionable moral convictions. He is hailed by contemporary writers as a trailblazing voice of freedom and a denouncer of censorship, who was certainly important in pushing pretty much every boundary imaginable, actions that surely led to the birth of most of the literature we have covered on this channel. And yet, while there are brief instances in de Sade's writing where it does seem that he is concerned with criticizing the hypocrisy of a savage and unjust society that seeks to sublimate its own hangups through punishing deviants like him, for the most part, uh, what I get from his writings is just the crazed thoughts of someone who is obsessed with maiming extremities and penetrating every orifice imaginable. Oh, and also uh, eating shit. Like, lots of it. The 120 Days of Sodom was written in 1785 while de Sade was in prison, where he spent most of his later years due to having been sentenced for just being a disgusting, depraved, and vile man. It was written on a long script kept inside a protective cylinder, the writing as tiny as possible so as to fit as much depravity in this limited space as he possibly could. De Sade was eventually transferred from his prison in the Bastille to another facility because he kept flashing people through his window. No, I'm not kidding. And his manuscript remained unread and unseen for decades and was thought to be long lost until it resurfaced by chance in the 20th century and then presumably someone read it and thought, hey, that's neat, let's publish it. That someone really made quite the choice, let's just say that. The 120 Days of Sodom coined the most impure tale that has ever been told by de Sade himself is hardly a novel. It's hardly a book. It reads much more like a long overwrought litany of deviancy or the incoherent diary entries of a lunatic, which they kind of are. The loose semblance of a plot concerns four libertine men who gather a unique set of guests and lock themselves away in a castle for five months to act out the wildest, most putrid fantasies and sexual acts imaginable. Among their guests are an ensemble of four elderly sex workers who continuously detail their various sexual adventures over their long lives in the profession. And then the libertine men in turn, after hearing these stories, choose their favorites to act out on a set of young boys and girls that they have also brought to their castle. Things escalate, the violence ramps up over the months of enclosure, and by the end of their stay, let's just say we're gonna need a cleanup on aisle seven. Of this five month cycle, de Sade only managed to finish up the stories detailed in the first month before he was transferred from his prison and forced to abandon the manuscript. And thus the remaining four months of debauchery were unfinished and are presented only as a list, the outline which de Sade penned and seemingly intended to flesh out later. And boy, do things get repetitive in this book but hardly in a boring or insipid way. Now, I understand most of us are familiar with this title because of the 1975 film adaptation by Pasolini. Pasolini charged the story with brutal political commentary, and his film is a significant anarchic revelation of the depravity of the state and the victimizing of the most vulnerable flesh. De Sade, however, it seems, uh, was just much more interested in talking about mutilation and excrement in fine detail with no particular purpose. In fact, I was a fan of the film before I even knew it was a book and then a friend told me, oh, you should read the book. There's like tons of more poop in it in the book. 
Yeah, thanks man. This is hardly an easy read, in fact one that I barely managed to finish myself. It reads kind of like an overdone aristocrat's joke, uh, which it very much is. The scenes presented range from the mundane, like someone getting their bones broken, yes, that's the mundane part, to levels of insanity that even I don't want to repeat. This is truly the ultimate test for those curious about exploring the vilest ranges of literature, and truly, if Desaad has become synonymous with disgustingness and depravity, I tell you, he has rightfully earned that reputation. Read this one at your own risk. <laughs> Wait, hold on a minute. I think I see another book in there. Oh man, we're gonna need reinforcements to get this one out. Here we go. Stand clear, I'm going in. Oh, my hat. Come on, come to daddy. You know you wanna get out of there. <laughs> there it is. You almost got away, you little fucker. Oh, Jesus Christ. Not you again. Yes, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to talk about this one again if we plan to cover the topic of disgusting books. It's Hog by Samuel R. Delaney. I should have smelled this one coming from a mile away. Wait, did I say that Desaad's shitfest was the ultimate test of disgusting literature? Man, I think Mr. Delaney has a thing or two to say about that. Yes, I previously covered this book in my video of Books I Cannot Read, where I talked about all of the reasons why I will never read this thing. It feels weird having to tell you all about a book I haven't read, but while yes, I never finished reading Hog, trust me, I know of its power, I know of its reputation, I know it reeks like few books do. Well, what can I say? Uh, Hog was written in 1969, an appropriate year, uh, but did not actually find a publisher until 1995, because it's Hog. Samuel R. Delaney is mostly known as an author of science fiction. Uh, hell, his novel Dahlgren is usually hailed as one of the finest of the genre. So how could this classic sci-fi author be in such a list as this? Well, because somewhere along his appraised trajectory of writing about space travel and infusing sci-fi with a unique LGBT imagination, Delaney decided to take a quick detour and write the most revolting thing imaginable. I mean, I get it. Even in his sci-fi works, we can see that Delaney is highly interested in exploring sexuality and transgressing boundaries, both bodily boundaries as well as social ones. As I have stated before, I am actually a fan of his sci-fi works and have even recommended one in a previous video, for I do see an unmatched intelligence in his prose, uh, concerned with themes that are important social commentary on our views of sex, gender, and the politics surrounding such topics. Moreover, from what I have heard from critics who have praised Hogg, uh, who have actually read it, it seems that those concerns are fully present in this book as well. As for myself, I got as far as like page 35 before I shut this shit down and just put it away. So I cannot really review Hogg. I cannot tell you much about it, nor would I want to, and uh, except that what I read was just too much for me. There's a savage depravity in the voice that tells the story, the cold detachment with which every single deranged sex act is recited. I bring this book up only because uh, for those watching a list of this kind, it is sure to be a point of interest that you likely wanted to hear about, but all I have to say beyond this is, don't say I didn't fucking warn you. I really, really hope this is the last time I have to talk about this one. Well. It looks like that's all we're gonna get out of this. I wonder where I'll be able to find more books. Actually, you know what? I think I left one in the fridge. Uh, let me go get it. Oh shit. You know what? I think my fridge isn't working properly. Oh, even through the fucking aluminum foil, I can smell it. This book's gone bad. Oh, huh, never mind. It's just Less Than Zero by Brett Easton Ellis. This book didn't go bad. It's always been bad. Now, I know what you're thinking. Brett Easton Ellis, why aren't I talking about that other book that he wrote? You know, the really messed up one that everyone talks about in lists of this kind? Well, okay, let me just address this whole mess. Yes, American Psycho exists. 
It is a book condemned as one of the most disgusting and unhinged things ever written. Yes, I have read it. Yes, the scene with the rat. Yeah, I know, I know. It's a book that's really supposed to mess you up. Or so people will have you think. If I'm being completely honest, I wasn't particularly rattled by American Psycho and actually neither were many of the people I talked to who have also read it. I think the magic of American Psycho, the mysticism of it, is more in the anticipation, in hearing about it, in hearing about how fucked up it is. However, once you read it, you will find that there's a comical glee to it that I think is very much intentional and Ellis is purposefully detailing a big farce. It's a book that's really about nothing except building the reputation it successfully attained over the years, so I guess it works in that sense. But it is my opinion that if you truly want to witness the true prowess of Ellis as a sower of dirty little tales, you must read his first novel, Less Than Zero, instead. Published in 1985 when Ellis was only 21 years old and written when he was only about 16, this book is a rare peek into that unrelenting angst and cold nihilism that one can only truly be overcome by in those poignant years of puberty. Less Than Zero takes place in Los Angeles and honestly that statement alone should already have your stomach turning. There's drugs, there's snuff films, there's isolation and chaos, uh, very much like our earlier entry, Frisk, although this was written years before that. And what Frisk achieves through Cooper's lyrical and mystifying prose, Ellis chooses to tackle with a cold and revolting fierceness that makes his book all the more repugnant and truly upsetting. It is told in a series of events unfolding during the winter break of college student Clay, who returns to LA to spend his vacation revisiting some old friends. Now let's just say Clay's friends are into some really messed up stuff. And here's really the magic that in my mind raises less than zero miles above American Psycho. What American Psycho exaggerates in farcical glee, less than zero expresses with a tragic sense of loss at witnessing things that can truly happen, most certainly have happened. To me, there's nothing that fills me with more disgust than a book that so grotesquely captures the foul veracity of real life. The book follows Clay's eyes as he witnesses the most despicable, stomach-churning acts. Eyes that recognize that there is such a thing as right and wrong, but are nonetheless powerless in acting against a world that just doesn't give a shit. There's drug overdoses, prostitution, human trafficking, decaying bodies rotting in the cold streets of California. It's all here. Truly, this little novel stands out in my mind as some of the most rancid indictments against urban decay and aimlessness. Ellis has here written a book where you can truly feel the sweaty shoulders of tweaked out kids bouncing up and down a house party, unsure of what they're even going to do with their lives. And for that, I salute him. There's a dangerous proximity to that nihilistic outlook that youth possesses, which truly makes Catcher in the Rye look like little rascals. Now this next book came in this little plastic bag that someone left on my doorstep. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's dripping a little bit, but uh, that's okay. We can grab a paper towel later. What? No, that's not blood. Anyway, let's open this bad boy and see what's inside. Ooh, if I were blind, I would think it's a dead rat, but no, it's The Melancholy of Anatomy by Shelley Jackson, first published in 2002. Now, this is a weird one. It's a true standout entry into this list, which more or less has cohesive themes running throughout all of the titles I've included. Everything else has been gore and decay and depraved sex acts, uh, depravity in general, and lots of poop. Man, how many times am I gonna have to say poop in this video? I'm gonna say it a lot more. I'm just, I'm just warning you. But this, this short story collection truly has nothing of the sort. There's no violence in it that I can recall, not anything extreme at least. And while there are body fluids galore, nothing is expressly mentioned to repulse or shock, not the way Desaad would include them. So what is this book all about? What I can say is when I read this book, I felt repulsed in such a unique way. It made me feel things that I can honestly say no other book has ever made me feel, and truly it made my skin crawl a handful of times, appropriately so. 
Jackson's short stories in this quaint little volume all have to do with some kind of body part or growth, down to the cellular level. Except said anatomical structures or functions are exaggerated, giantized, or placed in extremely jarring positions and situations. For example, one of the stories is about sperm cells. Except in the story, sperm cells are gigantic, and some people choose to keep them as pets, and other people choose to kill, cook, and eat them as a delicacy. In another story, phlegm is recontextualized as a highly valued substance which plays a major role in people's sex acts. Yet, Jackson does not write it as gross and yucky as she very well could have. In another story, an entire city menstruates, and in another story still, there's a giant fetus that appears in the sky and people venerate it as a deity. There's stories about cancerous cells, about ovules, about giant organs, and Jackson's prose is so quiet, so restrained, never really going for the shock value. And to me, this makes the stories all the more horrific and bewildering. It is truly that recontextualization of the parts that turns such ordinary body components into sublime apparitions or just downright nasty situations. Truly, this book is one of a kind and one that I'm sure is going to challenge some readers due to its unorthodox style, but if you can stomach it, I tell you, you will find tales in here that are so strange and off-putting that you may just never feel comfortable with your body ever again. And I mean, truly, I mean, if you were to see every inch of yourself under a microscope, you would probably want to tear your eyes out. Anyway, have fun. All right, on to the next book. I think I left this one in my gym bag, so I don't know, I'm gonna have to see. You know, it's been a while since I used this, you know, lockdown and all, but let's see, what have we got here? Ooh, that's straight up aged cheddar, circa 2020. Oh, she's got some Parmesan. We got some Romano. Where the hell is that book? Ah, oh, here it is. Um, ooh. Sadly, it absorbs some of that sweat and glory, but all the more appropriate, I guess. Here we have Child of God by Cormac McCarthy, first published in 1973. McCarthy has been covered before here on this channel with Blood Meridian, a worthy entry in our disturbing book's journey, and The Road being, of course, a disquieting tale as horrific as it was depressing. Now we arrive at Child of God, where we explore the descent into madness and deprivation of our main character, Lester Ballard, a child of God, much like ourselves. McCarthy's prose, as I have stated before in other videos, is uncompromising and it oscillates between cold detachment and a downright flourish of beautiful and touching prose. It is told through a voice that is sometimes sympathetic, condemning, and just downright appalled, much like most of the readership, I presume. We see Lester go from a state of neglect within society into cave-dwelling homelessness out in the wild, eventually devolving further into a life of crime and horrifically insane acts. Uh, this is all pretty much routine by now, isn't it? Among the various depraved acts that Lester commits are robbery, murder, sexual assault, and eventually he turns to his true passion, necrophilia. There's going to be more on that later. Lucky you. You should already know by now, Mr. McCarthy pulls absolutely zero punches. Everything is laid bare to the savagery of life, the devolution of a man into a state of pure lunacy and survival. Everything told is a train derailing before your eyes, and there's something so sickly captivating about McCarthy's prose that refuses to let you turn away. There's truly no other tale of regression quite like this one, where an author so masterfully dissects the meaning of humanity, pulls out all of its guts and drains it of its blood. Slowly but surely, we see the character of Lester become a hardly conscious human being, and that descent is difficult to stomach, incredibly taxing and draining for the reader, a disgust that I truly feel only McCarthy could provide. As Lester leaves society behind and loses all sense of civilization and reality, there's something so stomach-churning about witnessing that narrative shift into desolation. We are essentially left alone with Lester, and for fuck's sake, I don't want to be left alone with Lester. We are left with Lester living in dirt and covered in his own shit, blood-soaked and angry and aimless and dangerous. 
If you are a fan of transgressive fiction and if you want to see how well psychological deterioration can be captured through prose, you definitely have to give this one a shot. It was one of those books that made me glad to be in the comfort of my home while reading it and yet there's something so deeply gut-wrenching about the notion that beyond the four walls of our enclosure, out in the wilderness, is where the basest animalistic form of humanity can take hold. The transformation is just so believable that McCarthy utterly convinces that to be human means to be in a frail state of sanity. Do we all have unhinged, sadistic, and utterly nefarious impulses just waiting to be unleashed? It certainly makes you at least think about that. Nasty, nasty stuff. Man, why are all of these books so hard to find? I swear, I had the next one in my hand, and then I fell asleep, and then I changed clothes, and... Wait a minute. Aha! Uh -huh. Here it is. Oh, why is it so stinky? I thought I showered last month. Uh, anyway, here's another familiar face around these parts. Haunted by Chuck Palahniuk, first published in 2005. First off, let's reiterate. Uh, as I discussed in my Can a Book Kill You video, one of the stories in this tome may or may not possess the ability to actually make you pass out from how utterly repulsive it is. Great, let's go ahead and see what else we got in here. Actually, that story, Guts, is only one of the many told throughout the frame narrative of Haunted, which concerns a group of 17 individuals who go off on a writer's retreat hosted by a Mr. Whittier, in which they will be held in captivity and isolation so that they may compose their magnum opus and tell the most masterful story they have ever told. This mirrors the similar retreat to Villa Dodati that eventually gave birth to Frankenstein, for example, and also in my mind lives as a kind of Canterbury Tales meets Fight Club. Now, the framing narrative is its own story of insanity and escalation of violence that is sure to also entertain, but the real juices flowing and oozing out of this book, the real pungent flavors that have cemented Haunted as a disgusting classic, concern the different colorful short stories that these 17 individuals managed to tell while in isolation. 23 stories in all, including Guts, there's something for everyone here. If you're not used to Palahniuk's writing style, Essentially, he often focuses on bringing up strange and bizarre facts, real life phenomena that he then uses as the focal point of a story which he blows up into all out debauchery. There's plenty of that in here and also plenty of, I would assume, semi autobiographical circumstances that led to the stories coming out as embarrassing confessions being blurted out. This book reads a lot like a therapy circle where the gloves come off and plenty of stuff comes out. Palahniuk himself has said uh, that during various writers associations meetings that he frequented that he often bore witness to the most insane and incredible real life accounts being told by unassuming folk and that's essentially what we have here. We have seemingly ordinary people telling of anatomically correct child dolls being molested, cross-dressing sex workers being brutalized for a quick buck, a variety of masturbatory mishaps, castrations, and tons and tons of murder confessions of the most unexpected and unheard of kind. Palahniuk writes larger-than-life characters, and although often he's most concerned with style over veracity, nonetheless, the stories that plague Haunted are sure to leave you feeling like you just walked through an orgy that you just didn't want to go to. It's rife with cacophony, absurd violence, and yes, poop makes its glorious comeback here. Admittedly, for my own taste, some of the stories here are a definite miss, but nonetheless, this collection is an exemplary tour de force from Mr. Palahniuk, who deserves to be mentioned as one of the few authors out there who actually delights in making people empty their stomachs for a living. Haunted displays the underbelly of personal lives that is rife with potent odors and explosive sights in a celebration of disgust and of those stories that we certainly all have, but few dare to tell. Oh my god. I'm so embarrassed. You've been sitting there just listening to me ramble off and I never even offered you anything to eat. Please forgive my rudeness. Here. 
let's dine, you and I, as friends. Now, I have to warn you, uh, I cooked this up uh, like a few weeks ago and then I forgot about it, so I really have no idea what's underneath. I guess we can both find out at the same time. It'll be our little adventure. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put this on um, for safety, you know? All right, uh, uh, here we go. Oh, sweet Lord. That's one pungent beast. Well, uh, let's dig in uh, as soon as my eyes stop watering. Well, what do you know? It's Filth by Irvin Welsh. What a surprise. First published in 1998, Filth came from the same mind that brought us the Scottish classics Train Spotting and The Acid House. While we still get some of that lovely Scottish dialogue that makes his book so difficult to read, uh, Filth now explores another echelon of Scottish life that delights in its brutishness, depravity, and disarray. The life of seemingly unassuming police officer Bruce Robertson. Now Bruce is down on his luck, to say the least. After surviving brutal child abuse, which he really doesn't like to talk about, and being left by his wife who took the kids with her, Bruce needs an outlet to release all of this pent-up rage and dissolution with the world. He does this through various means like all-out partying in Amsterdam, being totally inept at his job, and mostly through the games, which are a series of scenarios that he plans out specifically to fuck with his co-workers and the people around him, their sole intent to just make others' lives miserable. A myriad of sociopathic tendencies abound in the narrative, there's violence that is looked at with indifference, and the language of racism and hatred is not just present in constant expletives, it's essentially the language of choice for most of the narrative. Bruce is filth, and he is proud of it. And he delights in making everyone, including the reader, uncomfortable and uneasy. The constant despicable acts he partakes in mask a vulnerable interior, a life that Bruce has led full of abuse and neglect which is nasty in its own right and in typical Welsh fashion, the hard-boiled exterior of his world is meant to mask those tender and relatable instances of pain and sadness. Nonetheless, the exterior that I mentioned accounts for most of the grotesquerie that makes this a truly disgusting tale. Moreover, after ingesting some spoiled pies, we come across perhaps the most peculiar aspect of the novel's structure. A tapeworm starts to grow inside of Bruce's intestines, and the tapeworm itself starts to interrupt and sometimes even dominate the narrative through these visual configurations. At first simply demanding more food, eventually the tapeworm gains cognition and starts to admonish and pity Bruce along with everyone else. When we have an entire section of the narrative told from within the intestines of a character, you know we're in for a particularly rancid ride. Filth with all of its cocaine, self-destruction, and intestinal misadventures is sure to satisfy those who are gluttons for punishment, and yes, even more poop. Welsh is unflinching, his characters delighting in their grossness and imperfections, and yet he still takes time to pull at the heartstrings and make us see the true humanity in these grimy monsters roaming the streets of Scotland. If only to witness a tapeworm have more decency and properness than a cop, uh, this is definitely an intriguing, revolting, and hilarious read uh, in a guilty sort of way. <coughs> oh shit. I think filth really did me in. It's really not sitting well with me, so to speak. You know what, I have to run to the toilet. Uh, yeah, I have to, I have to. Oh my God, it's coming. <laughs> So, I'm back from the toilet, um, I don't want to talk about it, but while I was there, something did come up, or rather, came out. It's this! Oh, sorry. The Necrophiliac by Gabrielle Whitcop. Hmm, that's strange. I don't remember having French food. But yes, here's another book I've talked about before, as I read this very recently and did an entire review of it. but. Really, the things in this pages, while brief, are so noxious and cruel that, come on, this has to be in the list. First published in 1972 in France, Whitcop's novella is as straightforward as its title. We follow Lucien, a man who 
fucks dead bodies. That's it, that's pretty much the review. Well, actually, it's much worse than just that. While we have previously mentioned necrophilia as with good old Lester, Whitcop here has wrought an entire diary replete with entries detailing every single instance that Lucian has dug out, cleaned, penetrated, slept with, and otherwise fondled dead body after dead body. Lucian is completely indiscriminate. Men, women, children, so long as they're at a certain level of putrefaction, they're game to be the object of his love. Whitcup writes with such vividness that the beauty of her words and descriptions is hard to ignore, and yet what hits you in all this vividness is the stench of rotting flesh, the musty smell of the moths plaguing his Parisian apartment, the watery corrugated skin of bloated bodies slowly excreting the last of their liquids, the texture of cold stone-like limbs, everything, just a constant flourish of death and putrefaction for its entirety. Lucian explains only partly and with great obfuscation his motivations behind his love for the dead, for he is much more concerned with telling us about the his titillation and every sensation of his experience. Of course there's a dark psychology that's explored here, but only in part and in glimpses. What's so relentless about this lean work is that its pages do not let up, and Whitcock makes you witness its subject matter without allowing you so much as to blink. The necrophiliac is sure to upset even veteran stomachs, for as I said it's a different kind of transgressive fiction than what most lovers of the extreme tend to be used to. Whereas most works of this kind tend to just rattle off descriptions galore just to see what sticks and shocks, Whitcup's words are methodical, they're married to the subject matter. They slip into the scene seductively and wholeheartedly. There's an intimacy to the narrative that very few writers would dare to partake in. Therefore, this stands out as a true testament to the power that a narrative voice can hold, to truly plunge us into the depths of hell with a vicariousness that betrays our empathy and tolerance. I'm telling you, read this only if you're ready to see things that have surely happened, things that exist and should exist only behind closed doors. Whitcop to me is one of the few authors who have truly managed to fling those doors wide open. Well, that's been quite a ride, hasn't it? Honestly, I just feel kind of bleh. I mean, that's the word for this video, isn't it? Well, I hope you enjoyed all of that, if it can truly be enjoyed. Uh, thank you for being brave enough to partake in this entire journey with me. You've really earned yourself a trip directly to the shower. If you read any of this titles, as always, let me know. Uh, let me know what stood out to you. Let me know which disgusting, revolting tales you have read that weren't on this list, but that you're sure will make us toss up our cookies. Uh, there's links in the description if you want to follow me on social media or if you enjoyed this video and you want to support me by leaving a tip, you can do that too. Uh, but honestly, you don't have to. You have proven your worth just by watching all this mess. Now, uh, I hate to be rude, but I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. I don't like the way you've been eyeing my garbage. It's mine, I said. Get out! But do come back whenever. It's so lovely to have you here.